You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Professor Jacopo Bongiorno. Um, he's, the, he's part of the nuclear engineering department at MIT. We'll be talking about uh, artificial blubber that they're creating to keep uh, Navy SEALs warm, which sounds really interesting. So, Jacopo, thank you for coming. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, I guess, I don't know, is the human body not very resistant to water temperature with conventional wetsuits? Like what's the need for this? Yeah, it, it absolutely uh, depends on the temperature of the water one jumps in, as I think we've all experienced that particular certain latitudes. If you stay in cold water uh, for too long, then uh, your body starts to feel numb. And uh, if you really stay in there for too long, then you go into what uh, in medical terms is called hypothermia, and that can uh, ultimately ultimately kill you. So particularly for applications either defense related or even um, uh, even recreational uh, if one wants to stay in cold water for long periods of time traditional wetsuits are probably not um, a uh, you know sort of a good option yeah I don't know much about them but I thought wetsuits were designed to uh, you know keep the cold out they like how you know if you if I was in cold water cold meaning I don't know 50 degrees Fahrenheit without a wetsuit versus with one how much longer would I last with a conventional wetsuit so conventional wetsuits do provide a certain amount of uh, thermal insulation, so you're going to be much better off with a wetsuit, any wetsuit, than being sort of bare in the water for sure. But uh, you're still, it, once again, depends on how cold the water is, but let's say freezing water, literally in, you know, um, polar uh, environment, uh, you, you probably wouldn't last, uh, you know, without a wetsuit, probably minutes and, and with a wetsuit. Uh, conventional wet, so maybe you know twenty or thirty minutes. In fact, these numbers have have been published, and and we include them in our in our publication. And our goal from the beginning was to see if we could extend for a given water temperature, a given low water temperature, the time to hypothermia by a factor of two or three. And we we think we found a way to do that. So were you studying uh, what whales or dolphins or what what kind of animals were you studying to look at their blubber? Yeah, it's interesting you, you you asked me that question because, in fact, the initial impetus or initial inspiration for our work uh, did come from animals that um, normally um, live and operate, so to speak, in, in very cold waters. And so um, there are essentially three approaches the, that animals use to uh, uh, protect themselves from, uh, from frigid waters. The first is blubber. That's uh, for... Uh, uh, seals and, and the like. Essentially, blubber is a thick layer of, of fat matter that has a fairly low thermal conductivity, or if you wish, a high thermal resistance. And the thicker it is, the more insulating um, that blubber is. So that's the first approach. A second approach, which is used, uh, used for example, by otters, is to um, have a, uh, a, a very thick coat of hair and it's so thick and it is designed in a certain way that it actually traps some some uh, some air in it and it's uh, it's the air within the hair within the hair coat that uh, that basically provides insulation because air is a um is a gas and as such is as, uh, does not have a very high condu- conductivity for for heat so it insulates the body and then the third approach is uh, for blood, uh, for uh, excuse me, for warm-blooded animals uh, such as orcas or even great white sharks, the body actually generates um, uh, heat at a much higher rate than other animals, and by generating heat internally, they're able to keep the body temperature at a higher level. So we initially look at all these different strategies, and we decided to uh, uh, focus on on. Uh, 
uh, some technology that would mimic these three different strategies. Well, I guess there'd be a bunch of trade-offs. Like, you know, you couldn't have a very furry suit because that would probably trap tons of water and weigh the person down. So blubber seems like, you know, in a water environment, probably the best solution. Yeah, and so we indeed uh, start with, um, with, with an artificial blubber. And you're absolutely correct. There are, there are trade-offs. There are, there are limits. One cannot uh, simply don a wetsuit that is, you know, three centimeters or two, two inches, say, uh, thick, because then you would, uh, your movements would be impaired, right, um, for example. And, and so our goal was to design a wetsuit that would effectively feel the same way in terms of a dynamic interaction with the body. Uh, you know, the way it would allow you to swim in the water would feel like a traditional wetsuit, say, five or, or, or seven millimeter thick, uh, but it would have a far superior uh, thermal insulation property. And, and, and so the, the way to do, the, the way in which we accomplished that was by um, replacing the gas that is normally present in neoprene. Neoprene is the material that wetsuits are made of with a gas that has a lower thermal conductivity. And we're able to show that uh, uh, resulting material as, as a much better insulation than, uh, than traditional wetsuit, than traditional neoprene and therefore traditional wetsuits. Do you have a, a, like an air gap layer and then the blubber begins or you know, how is it uh, structured? So we, we don't have an air gap. Um, th there are some uh, air gaps that naturally develop uh, between th the body and a wetsuit. Uh, that's almost, I would say, independent of the material the wetsuit is made of. It's just that the fit of a wetsuit might not be perfect. And so you do have some air gaps present. Um, those air gaps actually theoretically would help with the insulation because, again, air, air is, is, a, uh, is a good insulating gas. Um, but we're not relying on those air gaps to provide insulation. We have actually um, uh, introduced a low, uh, an insulating gas within the neoprene material itself. So let me maybe take a step back and describe what neoprene is. Neoprene is, is rubber, and uh, in, in, um, in, in the form that it's used in wetsuits, it's sort of a, uh, a foam rubber. So in other words, you have, think about Swiss cheese, right? So you have rubber, but you have a lots of pores or a lot of, lots of holes. And uh, the, the insulating property of a wetsuit or a neoprene comes um, partially from the fact that neoprene itself, the material, the rubber is low thermal conductivity, but perhaps more importantly by the fact that you have all these uh, air trapped within, within the material itself. Now, we, uh, we studied the way in which heat is transferred across this material, and we found that roughly half of the heat transfer actually occurred um, or occurs through the gas itself. And so it matters which gas you have in there. And so the idea, the initial idea for our technology is very simple. Instead of using uh, nitrogen and air, which is the gas that you would find within traditional um, neoprene, we have replaced that with uh, lower thermal conductivity gases such as xenon uh, or argon and, uh, and krypton. And so those are heavier gases, and as such, they tend to conduct heat uh, less well, which is, which is good news in this case because you're trying to insulate, in, to insulate the body. What about the, uh, the porosity as you go from in to out? You know, is there a, would it help to have, uh, have it highly porous on the in, innermost side of it and then less porous as you go out towards the water side? I mean, are there any, like, advantages to structuring it like that? So th that's not how um, wetsuits are typically designed. They have a, uh, a, a, a the, the neoprene for traditional wetsuits is essentially as a porosity distribution, which is uniform. The pores are everywhere and they're more or less the same. But uh, your, your idea is a good one. One, uh, for example, could think of smaller pores on the outside uh, to prevent essentially the, uh, the gas that you've introduced as your insulating gas uh, to leak out uh, 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 very easily. And in fact, that's what we are sort of uh, tackling now in research spaces. We have shown conclusively through both, um, you know, coupon samples as well as full uh, treated wetsuits that indeed our idea works. In other words, it, it reduces the effective thermal conductivity, if you wish. It increases the thermal insulation of the, of the wetsuit. Uh, but uh, what we have not been able to show is that once 
we treat the wetsuit with that new gas, that gas stays in for long periods of time. And so, in fact, we see that it leaks out uh, over, depending on the gas and depending on the, on the neoprene that, uh, that we use to begin with, that, uh, that the gas might leak out over a period of, say, uh, 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, the process is reversible, which is interesting. So if we retreat it, we regain the, the good properties that we want. But you can appreciate from a practical point of view, uh, there are some applications in which these, uh, you know, regular retreatment of the wetsuit would not be a big deal. But for example, if you are a, I don't know, a recreational surfer or, or a diver, uh, you would have to retreat your wetsuit every time. That may not be very, um, very convenient. So we're now focusing on uh, how, how do we create a barrier for that gas that would keep the gas in and therefore uh, make, make our effect permanent. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, does the gas tend to migrate out or does it tend to migrate in? Yeah, so in, in the tests that we do, it, tend, it tends to migrate both ways because essentially we have an open environment on, and on, uh, on both sides. But not surprisingly, if you have, um, for example, water on one side, which tends to have a, uh, a low diffusion coefficient for gas, and you have open air on the other side, then it will migrate primarily towards the open air side, just because it's the, the you know sort of it's the path of least resistance for the gas to leak out. Uh, and so I think it's going to boil down to uh, creating uh, some kind of a barrier, either on the surface of the material or preferably even within each individual pore so that when those pores are charged with that uh, new gas, basically the gas stays in. And, but that, you know, it makes for an interesting research, uh, research project now. Well, yeah, what have you learned about studying the blubber of various animals? Are there certain ones that have better blubber than others? Or, you know, is there a variation in the, uh, the thermal properties of blubber of, a, you know, of an orca versus a dolphin? Yeah, yeah. There, there is the, those variations are, are minimal because they all use the same material, which is um, animal fat. Uh, effectively, that's what blubber is made of. Um, in, in our material has a uh, an effective thermal conductivity or it, or insulation that is uh, far superior to to natural blubber. So we our, our comparison, our thermal comparison, so to speak, is not animal blubber. That was the initial inspiration, but our material actually has a much lower thermal conductivity um, already. Huh. So, um, in, in fact, it's interesting. In some extreme cases, we can get a, uh, an effective thermal conductivity of the treated neoprene, which is um, equivalent to the um, uh, thermal conductivity of air. So it's almost like you're wearing a, a garment made of air, right? So it's, uh, it, it's an interesting way to look at it. It's not, it's not really made of air. It's made of, another, it's made of a composite material that has a thermal conductivity of air. So... Um, very, very low, that is. Um, with animals, though, I mean, I guess, they, you know, they don't obviously have to recharge their blubber or, I don't know, maybe they do. Maybe gas is migrating into the blubber somehow. Um, what else is there to be learned from studying animals? Or do you feel like from here it's uh, going to be more of an engineering problem? No, no, there is still a lot to be learned from Mother Nature. You know, evolution works over very long periods of time and uh, through uh, just sort of random uh, uh, testing of combinations, uh, it does select the best, uh, you know, the best design possible, at least for the environment uh, in, in which it takes place. So, bottom line, there is there is a lot to be learned from from uh, from, from nature. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, there are animals that do not rely on blubber, but they do rely on on a thick coat of of uh, hair. Um, otters is one one uh, one that comes to mind. Uh, polar bears also use this. And, uh, and so we're trying actually now to combine uh, the two approaches. So the artificial blabber that, I, that we've just been discussing for the past 10 minutes with some kind of synthetic um, coat uh, that would trap um, some air uh, and, uh, and, and basically give you additional, additional insulation. The, um, the, the synthetic hair can also be engineered to reduce the drag you know, associated with the, with the body. And, uh, and, and so in addition to having insulating um, benefits, you might also be able to swim uh, faster uh, for a given amount of effort. And so we're looking at that, but uh, we, haven't, we don't yet have uh, conclusive results on that, on, on that particular idea that, that, you know, that I'm able to discuss now. Right now it's just sort of research. Is, is there, um, I don't know, what if you were able to direct the... Um the escape, of the, let's say there's two layers and the gas would preferentially escape towards the center. Maybe there would be a channel 
in the center that would uh, migrate the gas around to where it was deficient, needed. Maybe that would be a mechanism to keep it uh, there longer. Yeah, there are, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, possible creative ideas. But we're really trying to keep things uh, simple, practical, and, and low cost. Uh, again, we have a, uh, a portfolio of applications in mind from, from defense, from Navy SEALs. Incidentally, I should say that uh, the a, a treated wetsuit was recently tested in a in a Navy uh, trial uh, back in um, I think in May here in New England. So in in, in in cold water. I mean not obviously freezing water, but but pretty cold. And uh, um, qualitatively, the divers saw that the uh, uh, that that our our wetsuit was was warmer than than what they were used to. Um, but that's one application is say Navy SEALs because they tend to spend a lot of time in in water and that water is not always uh, nice and toasty. But um, I mentioned you know recre- recreational uh, divers, surfers, uh, triathletes, uh, um, shipyard workers that you know also the, all these categories people that um, would use wetsuits uh, as part of their activities and. Uh, you really need to keep things uh, simple, manageable, and and uh, relatively cheap. Otherwise, you're you're not going to have a market. So we're 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 trying to really uh, strive for that. In a normal wetsuit, what what percentage of the outermost part of the wetsuit gets wet? Like how deep does it saturate in? And is there anything to be gained there by, you know, having less of the suit saturate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. So uh, the pores are relatively small. Um, we're looking at things like hundreds of microns. Um, nonetheless, depending on uh, the, uh, uh, the the material, the neoprene itself, whether the material is laminated with a sheet of uh, nylon or nylon-like uh, material, uh, you you can have, as, as you just mentioned, penetration of water inside the pores. Of course, that's detrimental to the performance of the wetsuit. And so to the extent that you can engineer the inside of the pores to be essentially hydrophobic, um, you might you might avoid uh, you might avoid that. I think the way it's typically done is they put a foil or, or I call it a sheet of, uh, of of some plastic or some polymeric material on the outer surface that prevents uh, water from from coming in. On the inside, uh, the reason why it's called a wetsuit is because basically it's not a seal tight garment, and so you allow for a thin film of water. To penetrate between the skin and the wetsuit, um, and the, what's key there is to make sure that that water stays stagnant, that that it doesn't flow in and out of the wetsuit, because uh, otherwise you get you get very cold very fast, right? Um, but uh, generally speaking, yes, keeping water out of the material, out of the wetsuit material itself, is certainly a worthy, um, you know, a worthy um, uh, design goal. And what about you know on a person's body? I- I mean, from what I know, the head and the feet are the two greatest areas where heat gets exhausted. I mean, in in terms of making the suit, can you preferentially engineer it so that the areas that leak the fastest will leak the slowest or be the most insulated? Yeah, you you could. And and by the way, this gives me an opportunity to say that uh, it it also it's not just the wetsuit. You also uh, we are also looking at uh, treating uh, neoprene gloves or 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 caps or. or booties and so on. So I mean, it's the whole body has to be has to be protected. But you're absolutely right. Certain areas of the body uh, tend to um, leak more more energy or more heat out or lose more heat than than others. And it, it really depends on the uh, um, you know on on the proximity of the of the blood vessels to the surface. And so the uh, the, the head, the neck, uh, and so on, they tend to have a lot of uh, a lot of blood vessels close to the surface. So the surface is warmer. Which causes more heat loss, and so you you would want to protect there uh, preferentially. Um, and so I, again, in uh, it, with traditional wetsuits, you are somewhat limited because the way to protect it with 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 a fixed material would be to just increase the thickness of the material in that region. But uh, if you think about, um, for example, the, the 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 neck area, the shoulder area, and you are a swimmer, you want to make sure that your body moves freely or anyway uh, easily uh, because you're swimming and and, uh, and if if you're wearing a wetsuit that is very thick in those areas that limits your your motion so with our um, idea you would be able to maintain a thin wetsuit uh, so that it doesn't impair 
uh, motion and at the same time uh, have a, an acceptable uh, thermal insulation in those areas. Well, when you were talking about otters and animals with, you know, a thick layer of hair, like, you know, at least for me, luckily I still have my hair. But, you know, I guess part of the suit, maybe you can make a hat portion that uses the thick hair on the head and makes it very, very insulating with, you know, rubber hat um, in addition to the rest of the wetsuit. And then, you know, what if you were to make a back panel that was like super insulating? So at least when the person gets colder, there's still a reserve of warmer part of the body that can flow to the colder part and maybe keep it going longer. Maybe by preferentially making it thick in the areas where it can be thick and it won't impede you that it will help keep you warmer longer. Yeah. Yeah. Again, all, all good ideas along that line of thinking. We are studying, um, first of all, where the, the most of the heat losses take place, number one. But number two, also where most of the drag comes from if you are a diver, uh, the, an underwater swimmer. Mm -hmm. And not all areas of the body contribute to drag the same way. And if you can identify uh, which area contribute, uh, contribute the most, then you can put some uh, uh, drag reducing hair the same way that, that otters have it in, in those regions. And so it, it's not a simple problem. It actually entails really studying the details of how water flows around the human body in, in certain positions. And we discover as part of this project that there is not a very big literature out there on this. There is actually more literature on this for surface swimmers because I think it helps them improve in sports like the you know Olympic swimming and so on. Uh, not as much in uh, in underwater uh, swimmers or, or divers, if you wish. And so we're we're now basically uh, studying that problem using computational fluid dynamics, and uh, and it's it's quite interesting to see which areas of the body sort of give you give you the most drag. I'm not ready to tell you which areas there are because we're we're analyzing the you know the data right now or the results of the That's calculations. Fine. Is there any assist with the pressure as you go down, or is that detrimental to the you know, thermal insulation? Yeah, it is actually detrimental, and that's uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It's detrimental because as you go deeper, uh, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure of the water surrounding you, of course, goes up, and that tends to compress the pores, and so effectively you're going to have uh, a, a lower porosity in your neoprene, and that increases thermal conductivity, so your heat losses go up. This is well known also with traditional uh, with traditional wetsuit materials, and so we're uh, we're studying ways to effectively buttress, if you wish, or strengthen the the, the pores themselves, so that um, uh, even as you uh, dive deeper and deeper, your the, the porosity stays the same, and therefore your insulation uh, stays the same. Hmm. Yeah, it's a very challenging problem. A lot of interesting stuff. Um, what, fresh water versus salt water. I mean, I guess most of the diving happens in salt water, or most of the activity. Um, I don't know any any differences there, or that's not really material to what you're doing. No, no, no major insight I can give you there. Uh, the uh, dominant thermal resistance uh, um, to to heat loss, if you wish, in the system is indeed the um, the, the wetsuit. So in a way, the type of fluid that you have on the outside almost doesn't make much of a difference, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, water or uh, fresh water, or salt water. And, and uh, it might end up having a, an effect, uh, a significant effect potentially on the durability of whatever coating you put on the outer surface or to protect uh, or to, to create a barrier for the gas leak. Uh, or even if you end up coating the uh, you know the parts or regions of the wetsuit with synthetic hair, um, it might have, you know have an effect on on the durability of that of that hair. But we're not there yet. But we haven't yeah. we haven't studied the differences between uh, fresh water and salt water yet. Is it possible to put any electric potential or any you know in to the help uh, help make it work better? Yeah, so my, my, uh, I, we should have mentioned from the beginning that uh, this is a collaboration um, between two research groups here at MIT, my own and Professor Michael Stranos in the uh, Department of Chemical Engineering. And so uh, I, I, Michael eventually might, might want to tell you more about, uh, about his technology, but he has developed what he calls thermal resonators. Uh, essentially, these are uh, small devices that harvest um, energy and exploit uh, temperature fluctuations that are naturally present in the environment to, uh, uh, for example, charge a battery. So they, they, they turn some 
heat into into electricity and they charge a battery and then you could use those batteries uh, to um, uh, apply a, uh, a heat flux or, or to generate some heat to basically keep the body the body warm when you need it and so this in a way would be mimicking that third strategy that we see in nature in animals the uh, uh, warm-blooded animals that generate more heat internally to keep their body temperature high okay interesting well very good what what do you expect uh, will be some milestones for your group in the next six months or a year yeah so we have uh, connected with a um, with a um, navy lab here in massachusetts that does uh, testing of uh, wetsuits uh, gloves uh, caps, booties, the, you know, the whole uh, set of garments that uh, Navy divers use for their dives. And uh, uh, we will be starting, I think, next week or the week, uh, the following week, testing sort of a very systematic testing of different materials that we've been um, that we've been developing in that lab. And hopefully this will confirm uh, not just on on coupon samples and not just qualitatively with, with divers, but with an actual control setting in a lab that... Uh, uh, that these different uh, garments uh, will will have a, a better insulation property. They basically in this lab they use uh, mannequins uh, and uh, and they're able to um, measure the uh, heat losses at different locations on the human body under different conditions, say different water temperatures, uh, and uh, and of course with, with 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 different materials for for the garment itself. So uh, we are excited about that. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to. Strengthen our relationship to the, uh, you know, with with the Navy. I should also mention the project has been sponsored by the Neptune program, which is a uh, office of naval research uh, program, and uh, and you know we're excited to see if in fact these uh, these garments do provide a significant better insulation. Then ultimately we can we can deploy them in the field. That's great. And how can people find out more? Can they get in touch with the lab, or perhaps you? It's up to you. Uh, you know, we're very easy to find. You just go to mit.edu, type in either my name or Michael Strano's name, and, and you'll find our contact information. We're very happy to take questions, suggestions, comments uh, anytime. And uh, you know, if somebody is really, really interested, we might even invite them over to our lab and show them the treated wetsuits and how we measure things, and uh, and you know, have, have an interesting, exciting discussion about this this research project. Well, great. But Jacopo, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been really my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.